have Mr. Fraser T. Smith in the house, everybody. Oh my goodness, I can't, I can't believe it, bro. Thanks for having I can't me on, guys. It. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for, being show. Thanks for being a part of this. Like, this is... Big fan. This, this, do you know what, right? This is a conversation that is going to be very interesting to me. Because if I'm being very honest, when I first met you, you had finished the, uh, the Tinchy Strider record. And I had not known anything that you had done before that. So I just thought, when Ben was telling me about you, I just thought you was a guy who did that and then later on just become very successful. When I was going through your catalogue and I was seeing stuff <laughs> from Kano, yeah, like early <laughs> Kano, early Craig David, I was kind of blown away. I'm not going to lie. Your resume definitely speaks for itself. Can I just say as well, I feel like I might be talking through uh, the uh, the mic that Adele recorded from. Am yeah. I? Yeah. Is this one of the mics? Yeah, it's actually one of the mics. Yeah. yeah. You know what? We should talk about wh where are we? Like the environment. You know, we're in we're in the studio. Like yeah. this is a South special West place. London. Let's, let's, I mean, like this is not like many studios that you find in London. You know, when you walk in here, it's almost like you've been teleported to to LA or you know like the recording capital of the world like it's insane like you've got an incredible amount of gear here like the vibe the environment is like it's amazing mm. like every single time that I've been in here since you've moved to the studio incredible like yeah. talk yeah. about the space well, phrase, like. we been here about five years and I'd, I'd always went to those studios in LA or you know the biggest studios in London and I, I was, it was always my dream to have a studio this size. Mm. But you know when you go to them and you, you feel like they've just got the minimal gear in there because mm. they've got to be neutral because different people come in every day. I thought if you could have that size of studio but just make it your own and make it homely and put your mm. own stuff in so people felt at home but also you could record whatever you want to at any time. Yeah. So yeah. we've got the piano out there. We've, got, we've had st string players in here with yeah. choirs i mean we would often go to other studios to record like huge sections but pretty much you can you can bring whatever you want here which is amazing live drums but i mean i think the thing is is that this main room is like just feels like a bit of a hub of yeah of yeah creativity and i think when people come in they can shut the door no one's just dropping in it just yeah, feels yeah, like yeah. it's it's a homely kind of vibe when i first got in here i thought like this is, you know, the dream come true. And it's, I thought that, wow, this is actually bigger than any studio I could ever <laughs> imagine yeah. being in. And yeah. then when we did um, Bad Boys in here, we mm. had Stormzy plus five. We had Huss plus nine. I could imagine. There was me. <laughs> I could imagine. There was Manon. I mean, literally, I thought maybe I need to get a little bit of a bigger space <laughs> yeah. you know, just to like, accommodate. We, we, <laughs> we're filming this, by the way. Yeah, so yeah. What, for, for one, I say this for two reasons. One, you can see how insane the studio is. Yeah, and, all the um, accolades. If, you, you if, you're, if you're a young producer, you're just, you're just inquisitive and you want to know what a ridiculous studio looks like, check this the video it. out. And two, you can see that Fraser's really not that old. He's really doing himself a disservice, no, honestly. The man looks... I'm the man looks like 25? 40 yeah. The man looks young as anything. 40 something in. grime producers. If you, if like you get the Wikipedia up next to the video of Fraser right now, you'll see like he's done a hell of a lot in his years. So Just yeah. before I start at the beginning though, I need to know this off the cuff straight away, seeing as though we are a little bit on the Stormzy album. Did you play a little bit of the chords on... Um, Blinding, blinded by your grace. Blinded by your grace. Yes. Oh my goodness. One time for Fraser T. Smith Please. on the chords. Do you know what I tweeted today? <laughs> I said, "Ah, oh, you know, um, blinded by your grace, grace, velvet, and bad boys are my favourite songs at the moment. Mm. What's yours?" And I was really surprised at how much people that came back with. Blinded by your grace part two is my probably my favourite song on the album. Is, is it? it? Yeah. 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 It's I love crazy. It. It's like, how crazy. people like honestly like have. I love that record. And the thing is, it's like, I've, you know, obviously I've heard in little bits of that record, right? Prior. And, to yeah, but I, but, I, but I hadn't heard the whole album. And we sat here last week and Fraser played through the album and, you know, I was like, yeah, that album's insane. But as soon as it came out last Friday, you know, downloaded it at 12, was this like midnight, was listening through it and, yeah. you know, listening again. I just like really been listening to it the whole weekend and I was like, Blinded by Your Grace Part it's 2 a huge is record. just that is my shit like Harlem Gospel okay. Choir yep like yep. insane and I remember having a conversation with you where you were flying out to New York to do that and 
I just really? love it. The whole thing yeah, is amazing. Yeah. I can't like, wait to the, talk the about vibe that. of that record. We're uh, going we'll to get into that. We'll get... <laughs> a lot of people say, I'm a producer. And a lot of young people will say, I'm a producer. But, you know, it, it's not just about making music. It is almost being, like, set in the environment, almost being a therapist to a person and creating that environment which is going to creatively and musically get the best out of them. Mm. I mean, that that's how I look at it. That's how I've come to understand it over the years because definitely... When I was 15, I thought, if you make a beat, you're a producer. Like, But actually, like, you know, there's a lot of people that are amazing producers who actually may not be that musical, but mm. they know what they, what they know who they need to put in the room Completely. and they know what they need to do and the conversations that they need to have to get the record out. And I mean, I just thought it would be interesting to hear from your perspective, like what, what you make of that and what you think the difference between, like I guess, a beat maker and a producer is. And, I, think, you know. I think you hit the nail on the head, Benny. Mm. That's, that's whatever you have to do to, to make the artist feel at home. And yeah, the, the, the beat side of it, the music side, I think is very important, but it's important because you're, you're painting a picture at the end of the day. So you've got to, I think have the skills to be able to be aggressive with the music or touching or tender or a combination of the two. Mm. So I think you have to be able to to paint those colours, but there's always other people that can do that as well. Yeah. I mean, you can work with gifted musicians yeah. or you can work with people <coughs> that that make killer beats. And that's not to put down that that side of it, but yeah. I do think that somewhere along the line the beats have become so important that the other side doesn't matter. Mm. Mm. And I think that definitely the, the, the interaction mm. between people is, is the most important thing because no, you're it's, dealing it's with huge. emotion. It's and I huge. think that if you don't have that connection with mm. an artist, if, you, if an artist doesn't trust you and if an artist doesn't feel that they can be vulnerable, yeah. then you're yeah. never mm. going to... You're never gonna reach the depths of music that are gonna truly move, move people. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And that sounds a bit lofty in terms of what I'm saying, but I I think that and don't get me wrong, I love making a beat as much as the next person, and it's mm. it's massively gratifying, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm turned on by all the latest beat makers because I love that, but. It, it can't start and end there. Mm. I've always thought, like, you have a beat maker and you have a producer. You have a beat maker, then you have a producer. And sometimes the producer is the one who may not even particularly be pressing stuff mm. or, or playing stuff. But the person who actually says, you know what, take that out, put this in. Or play this, mm. play a little bit of that, you know. Um... Which is, that's something that I kind of, because people used to always say to me before, oh, why didn't you go in the studio? I think you could be a wicked beat maker. You could be a good producer. But I don't know how to start a beat. Mm. I wouldn't know how to start a beat. But I would know how to say, you know what, that doesn't sound right. You know, mm. take that out, put this in, take that out, add this, play this, do that. You know, what's your opinion on that? Like, I think, again, I think you, you said it really well. Chucky. I think that, it's orchestrating everything yeah. really you're you're a little bit like a conductor yeah of an orchestra in terms of all the different components that go into a record which are hundreds mm. down to like timekeeping to planning to organize studio sessions to mm. working on the actual technicalities of is that mic right is mm. it yeah. the best mic but is it actually we're not getting the best performance. Should we just do it out here? Because, you know, like, Kano's recorded vocals, like, lying on this couch. Because mm. it was the best thing Funny. to do in the middle eight of Seashells in the East End. Like, mm. it, that was just that, had that. And sometimes you have to make those calls and be able to make those decisions. It's about developing a great relationship with an, an engineer so that mm. you've met Manon over here who is fantastic and big up man on big up man on big up man on <laughs> but that's really important because if you're the artist Chuck and we we're going through stuff stuff still needs to happen yeah. and I found a while ago that 
because I'm a control freak and I typically be doing everything, it was very difficult for me to keep my focus and my attention and read what was going on with the artist. Mm. So now Manon enables me to do that because she's working at such a high level in terms of the sonics that we can we can talk, but also I'm present to be mm. working out what's going on in mm. terms of yeah the so, crazy uh, minds of amazing artists and it's good fun and the queen Adele yeah <sighs> so so when when did you meet Adele side so note I'm about just. That talking through her mic right now just for anybody yeah, who wants yeah. to just that is, you know I mean a, feel the ambience that is the, that's you know that's come mic. on <laughs> um, I to be honest I don't know what she listened to Adele had listened to to come in like yeah. whether it was so I'd done so many at that point at that point I'd had the Tinchy stuff come out the I'm not sure if she was a Kano fan probably is knowing her you know yep. she likes to rap um mm. i had broken strings nelly Furtado, and james morrison and like lots of other stuff so let, she, let's just say she was absolutely banging strider man and that was what let's say that yeah. i mean we in right yeah yeah <laughs> so, yeah. so how, how did the call come how did that call come her dell's manager jonathan dickens said well we set up a meeting just mm. just come and hang out for a bit, have a cup of tea and talk about stuff and had a great first meeting with her. And then she came in and we spent like four days together. We wrote like a couple of tunes to begin with. We're kind of piano based. And then she said, if I was Rihanna, what kind of, thing would I do because I think she'd probably heard like that I'd I'd done mid sort of up tempo stuff and she she I think she said she liked my drums that that she'd heard so I set up a loop on the MPC and had uh, the piano riff that I'd just started playing in the morning uh, which was set far to the rain piano riff and just started playing it and she came in and was into it and started to singing some melodies over the top and developed that song over the period of two days. Okay. Through, I mean, the melodies to her came quite easy because she's incredible and then she takes a lot of time over the lyrics. So she would, I don't know if you remember, Ben, the studio, well, you remember it. Chuck Farm it back. Lane again. Farm Lane. That was the way you did the number one? Mm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of time where she would go out to the kitchen. Do you remember the kitchen was like outside, yeah. stop the steps. I remember the kitchen. Yeah. Smoke, two packets of cigarettes. <laughs> not, mm. not that much, but felt like it. And just just come with lyrics, come back and say, you know, what do you think of these? And and uh, yeah, we we finished the song. But interestingly, at that point, she said the record's going to be produced by Rick Rubin. So don't worry too much about the production. But obviously, to me... What does who, this mean? Explain <laughs> to me what this means. Well... What did, she mean, what did she mean by that? Basically, she knew she was going to go to Malibu to record her record so she with was Rick. Gonna, okay. So she was writing with myself, Paul Epworth, various people to come up with the songs, to then take those songs to Rick who oh, would okay. produce produce the album. produce the album. Oh, okay, I get you. So she said to me, "Look, don't don't worry about you know, don't worry about the production." But that's a little bit like saying, "Kudia Schiffer wants to go out for dinner with you, but just come as you are. You don't have to like worry yeah. about changing. You don't have to get changed. You know, just just come in like <laughs> yeah. come in your jeans. I mean, you, <laughs> do you know what I mean, I mean you you're going to want to make sure yeah. that piano is I mean, going to Rick. It's yeah. going to Rick. You want to make sure the drums feel yeah. proper. So I remember I'd say, ah, oh, yeah, that's no, fine. I'll just you know just <laughs> work out the demo. I'll just you know, but obviously then spent like yeah. <laughs> four days straight on the on making the song sound pretty good and I mean but to be honest it was the MPC like drum loop tom loop I added some some program strings on it and had the piano had her vocal and I mean going back to 
like that feeling that you get in the studio. And I keep saying, like, please don't think I'm big headed, but please don't think I'm big headed because I would write maybe 300 songs of a year in a year, of which 280 aren't used. So mm. hopefully that brings things yeah. into perspective mm. in terms of like a lot of the things that I do yeah. aren't used and like aren't very good. Mm. So, but w when you've got something as special, well, for me anyway, when you've got something as special as Set Fast the Rain or Break a Heart or a lot of the songs on the Stormzy records or Made in the Manor or songs with Dave, you, you do know how you feel about them. Yeah. And there is a different feeling that you get when you, Here's you guys must know when you, yeah. you're part of, of a big record. And it's, it's almost like you, it's, it's beyond, you hope other people like it, yeah. but you feel like even if people don't, that's mm. fine. This is just, this just feels, feels like a good song. So, so I had that agonizing wait when I'd sent the song to Rick. He said he liked the piano. Adele disappeared for, I don't know, it felt like a year. Mm. Okay. And she called me up out of the blue one day and said, do you want to come over to my flat in Battersea? Because I want to like play you a couple of things. I was like, very cool. But excited to hear like the, the Rick not? stuff. Yeah. And she, she played me the Rick stuff and she said, look, I wanted you to hear Set Fire to the Range. I really want to hear what you think about it. And it was funny because she didn't say what she thought about it at all. And the way that Rick had produced it, I mean, it sounded amazing, as it would because it's Rick Rubin, mm. but it was like a half-time thing. So it just felt like didn't have that. Set Fire to the Rain is mm. that, sort of, that sort of beat, but this was was very very slow and she said what do you think about it it was like this sort of million dollar question so I thought well I'll just be honest I said look I'm a massive fan of Rick Rubin but this isn't doing this. it for me yeah. you know this is just not the way that I feel the song is feels like a early like U2 beat with the toms quite tribal and I think we've lost it and she said well actually I agree she goes I love Rick as well but I feel like we had what we had on the demo was the thing so she said how would you how would you finish the demo and make it into a finished record and I said well I'd get my friend Ash to play drums on it and we get some live strings and I think your vocals amazing you can try it again but I think we've got it and that basically became the finished record amazing. Yeah. all right uh big Mike with the beard <laughs> Stormzy um I want to know everything. I want to know the conversation that you and Twin B had. We've interviewed Twin B. He was the first on our a guest, as it goes. He was. He was, he was the our first, first guest, guest that we had. What a guy. And um, What a guy. I believe that he had a conversation with you, and he had a conversation with Stormzy, in it being a good idea that you work together. Mm. What was that conversation like with Twin? And why do you feel... He came to you. Why? Why did he? Why did he feel like you would be a good person to kind of start this? What would be a phenomenal project with Stormzy? Because you know, s s bearing in mind that we all know that Stormzy has had prior to this, is that like the hottest kid in the street. So everyone's looking at you know the next body of work, the album, mm. which is going <coughs> to be the mo one of the most important periods of his career. Why you? Why did he come to you? He, well, Twin said, look, I've been working with Stormzy and and I think it'd be a really good idea for him to come in, look at working with you on a body of work, but start with a week and just see how you guys work together. He said, I think it would be a, it would be a great idea because you would push him. You would, he said, he's got massive ideas, but he needs someone to be able to help foster those ideas and to help put those ideas into practice yeah you know, he knew that, that I could play a few instruments and would be able to get live players in and and take what he already got which was obviously amazing into a slightly different place so I had the initial meeting with 
Stormzy. And I mean, really at that point, after having worked so hard on Made in the Manor with Kane, I was, I loved what Stormzy was doing, but I, I wasn't drawn to like the hype because mm. I thought if anything, that would be a negative in terms of making a record with Stormzy. I, I thought I really want to hear what Stormzy has to say about the record that he wanted to make to commit to working with him because I felt I didn't want to repeat what Kane and I had done on Made in the Manor. Mm -hmm. And I felt, I always feel like when I'm in the studio with someone, I have to be giving them something that they can't, well, I can't get it somewhere else, but I have to feel like I'm, I'm of service to them mm. in a way. So we got talking and, and he was... Where, in the studio here? Here, literally. Oh, here? Yeah, okay. here. Okay. And we immediately hit it off. I loved his ambition in terms of what he was wanting to achieve in terms of the styles and sonics and adding instru live instrumentation but keeping the roots of his grime upbringing and, yeah. and not turning his back on the scene but opening up the whole genre and he said that his life was about gang signs on one hand and prayer on the other and he mentioned his faith and then we we hit on the gang signs and prayer title from that that conversation yeah it was literally like a spark where we just looked at each other and we said oh, it sounds like the album title and then we just got talking it was like a think tank from then I said well this could be amazing because the, the gang signs could be the bass and the drums and the prayer could be the strings and the harps and the choir and suddenly like the the whole visual aspect of, of the record, I could picture it. Mm. And I think that working from that concept was, was really important yeah. moving forward. And I think it was interesting that from that very beginning conversation, we had a thread that runs throughout the whole record that hopefully brings together the pretty diverse mm. gospel yet grime yet R&B yet mm. it's interesting to hear you talk about his ambition for wanting to sort of transcend the, the box I guess of grime because he's actually always had that as far as I'm concerned when you listen to Dreamer's Disease mm. It's not a grime EP, you know, no. by any stretch of the imagination. And I think like Stormzy was defined by like a few huge records mm -hmm. that happened to be at 140. But actually, like going to see his show even early on, like he had big sections where it was like very down tempo and like quite melodic and probably like quite weird to see if you've bought a ticket because like you wanted to come and see like Know Me From or whatever you know and you're going and you're 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 seeing a show where like he was just doing actually what what he wanted to do mm -hmm. you know um and i saw that show a couple of times in london and once in birmingham and just thought like it's going to be interesting to see where he goes with that because i'm not going to sit here and say i think that he was executing it like nailing it at that point but you could see the ambition was there you know so it's no surprise like actually when you come and listen to this album like just how broad it is and diverse it is in terms of concepts tempos uh, musicality all of these things you know and he, he always had that definitely yeah, and I, I think it's good that Twin has kind of had that foresight and thought you guys should actually should actually pair up because you've managed to really to really realise that for him on this on this record which is amazing by the way Thank you. I mean, yeah, we we <coughs> worked across to the record for ten months. Mm. Stormzy lives pretty close, so it's like that work that he was just in every day, and we started off with a week together, and we we recorded "Blinded by Your Grace" part one. Okay. In that in that week. Was it and always called part one? Or did he always have the vision there was going to be two parts of that? Yeah, or? yeah. He thought it was going to be two parts, but I think he felt like because part one is quite sweet, mm. that part two, we had this, he had this little choir sample 
that he brought in and, and he, he always thought it was going to go into like quite a dark mm. grime beat mm. after that and we we did that for a while and it just wasn't sitting that well so on that we I said look let's just it doesn't have to necessarily like segue from one to the other mm. let's just treat it I think he came up with that idea he said look Let's just treat part two as this other thing. So I was just playing around with the chords and Storms, he said, uh, you know, I like that bit of it, how that goes to there and it goes it goes to these, you know, slightly, slightly different place. And I responded to that and we looped that for a while and he was out there I'm not quite sure what was going on because he was always in the studio, but he was like outside of the room. He literally came back and said, oh, you know, I've got some melodies and started singing the majority of what the track is. Okay. Which I think if you... Because I think because Emanike is on it, there's nothing taking anything away from Emanike because Stormzy had, had come with the majority of the melody and then Emanike came and just put this incredible new take on his section and just took it from an amazing place to a to some other amazing place you know so mm. Emanike did an incredible job but what's important to know is how much storms he did at the yeah, very beginning yeah. of that mm. before Emanike came in yeah which I think you know to people that didn't necessarily know the depth of Stormzy's musicality you could say well maybe Emanike came up with the melodies Stormzy yeah. sang it yeah, of course. did his yeah, verse yeah, yeah. that would be the and easiest that was the thing track. to say I mean, yeah. you, you know there'd be a lot of people would think that but yeah. really Stormzy's <coughs> Stormzy's melodies are incredible mm. I mean Cigarettes and Kush all him yeah Velvet Velvet's one of my favourite comes in with the yeah. the Neo sample but a lot of the, the melodies on that. I think mm. he'd done he'd worked on a few in America, but he's super musical guy. Oh, you brought a choir in, did you say? Did you mention earlier about? We went to Harlem. You went to Harlem. Went to Harlem. Yeah. Harlem. Yeah. Okay. I actually just thought. I mean, we've been working for like seven, eight months, like every single day here. I just thought we need to get out of the studio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I just feel. want like the Harlem choir to be on this record. I just felt like I wanted that to see that. Yeah. Had you Harlem. heard them before? I mean, like, how, how did you come across them? Like, why was that even in your I, mind? I um, close to Damon Albarn. And yeah. well, we were, I mean, what was wrong with the Croydon choir? Like, what was nothing wrong with the Croydon choir. <laughs> yeah. you know, the maybe choir better. Maybe better, <laughs> but something about that Harlem. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. you feel... I just... <coughs> Love telling people the fact that, you know, me and Storm's here, we're going to Harlem, Harlem we're going yeah. to record these guys. Um, get some I soul, think even get from some soul here, food. Get some yeah, soul exactly. food before you went but for even from here, soul we session. Know, like, we know from... <laughs> there are amazing choirs here, like, yeah. obviously there's got to be. But, you know, like, we always... When you do think of, like, some of the bigger, biggest choirs as well, yeah. you, think, you do think of, like, like choirs in America yeah. and, like, how vibey they are. And, mm. Yeah, like... Yeah, amazing. So we literally... Book the, I think the schedule was quite crazy finishing the record, so we literally were there for a day. Mm. Got off the plane straight into the studio. Actually, excuse me, under underestimated massively the amount of time that we'd need. Mm. I don't know why, we just thought we'd send the parts and we could just, mm. it would just happen. Mm. And it was incredible, but I just, I wish we'd had a little bit more time mm. to spend there because we got 90% of what we needed, but it was like, we just should have had more time, basically. But the, it was an incredible experience. <laughs> just like the, the 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 vision of like you've rang up the Harlem Gospel Choir, like guys, yeah, like I've got this like British rapper Stormzy. We want to come over. We've got this song. We want to record it. What what are they thinking? Like, what is their reaction? Because are they are they like oblivious to like? you know, where Stormzy's at or what he's doing, like, do they, are they doing these sessions every day? This is just another another session for them. They're just knocking it, this out like it's nothing. Like, how was how was that whole... I... I mean, the American session thing is quite... When the time's <coughs> up, they're, they're out. 
Okay. <laughs> Yeah. So we got there maybe a little bit late. Yeah. I don't know, like play was delayed, customs, whatever. So mm. I'm thinking, <laughs> yeah, by the time looking at the watch, thinking we need to like establish a mm. thing here pretty quickly. No, I think they were pretty oblivious. Yeah, I feel like a few people were like, "Oh, we've we've heard of this we've guy. Or maybe him, yeah. they've googled, googled yeah, him, yeah, but yeah. it wasn't like it was actually f- weird for me going outside with Stormzy because bearing in mind. We'd work, it's kind of weird when you think about it. We worked together for like seven or eight months, yet never stepped out of mm. this building of course, of course. Yeah. with him. Yeah. And suddenly we were at the airport, and I was like, wow, like, this is kind of scary in yeah. that people were coming up, and I was thinking, just me and him traveling. Mm. And you could tell that it was, you can just feel that this could get out of hand mm. in Terminal 4 or whatever really quickly <laughs> going onto the plane yeah. and like people are like oh Stormzy 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 yeah it's yeah kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. yeah pretty completely well, different right? yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah mad we saw I saw Stormzy a lot over the summer as well um, he was doing a lot of the big stages at the time and he debuted Cold yeah I think the first time he did it Maybe it might have just been one of them moments where he's like, this is the first time I'm doing this. Nobody's ever heard this before, mm. whatever. I mean, he might have done it a couple of times before because I, I saw him do it a few times afterwards. But he did cold. And, like, the whole place was just going crazy. Like, at that, he just did a little bit of it. Where was that, in Germany? or was he like? No, it was here. Yeah. I think, uh, I can't remember the festival it was. Um, it was a, he was main stage, big festival, somewhere far out of the ends anyway, yeah. yeah. And it was popping off and he did it a couple of times. Talk to me about the finishing part of the album, though. Like, where did it finish? Where did it finish? Like, wh- at what point was it like, all right, we're done. Like, we're done here. There's nothing that needs to be added anymore. Like, where was that? What um, song was it? The uh, very last song was Lay Me Bear. Okay. So we always knew that Lay Me Bear was going to be this deep, emotional outpouring of emotion on a beat we tried a few different beats Stormzy didn't feel that right about any of them so but we always knew that that was going to be the last thing that we did like the very last 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 kind of gasp of the album Mm. what I didn't realise is that when he said last that that would actually mean like the day before it was going to be mastered. <laughs> mm-hmm. You're know, like this yeah. last, in my mind, was like, you know, when we finish the record, we're going to mix it, and then it's do, all yeah. nice. But last, last was <coughs> literally like finishing at three o'clock in the morning when we're mastering. Like, okay. It, you know. Um, so I think when he put his verse down on that, that felt. That was a missing, the mm. last missing piece in the puzzle. And by that time, we'd we kind of got a track list. And I said to him, maybe we don't need Lay Me Bear. You know, maybe it's like mm. we finish on Shut Up and it sort of comes mm. full circle, the journey, and we sort of finish with, like, your your big tune. And mm. and he said, no, 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 I just really feel like I've got a few things to get off my chest. Mm. And actually, as that happened, it... it just worked really well the process was that um, Stormzy got a vocal sample which is a quab sample and and some piano from EY the producer EY sent it over and then we did the drums and vocals and bass and stuff here in one night Okay. so it's kind of brought together like very very quickly but a lot of people say they like that that how how was it to sort of uh exec produce the record and collaborate with other producers that had maybe started ideas or you know had had tracks at varying stages but it was really your job to tie it all together and finish some of the tracks maybe just mixing some of them maybe really doing additional production or co-production of some of the records like how was how was that experience for you um as i guess an overseer it was i mean it, as you said it was it was taking like the big picture I think was the most important thing so coming back to the concept and listening to you know the 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 songs but it, it, to be honest it, as you just said it was a very three dimensional approach yeah. because 
On one hand, we were writing lyrics together for Blinded by Your Grace. On another hand, I was mixing it with Manon. Mm. So it was like a, a multiple roles, mm. which is, I think is is what I always enjoy most. Yeah. yeah. So, but obviously, taking the overview with with Stormzy was was you know a big thing. Yeah. I think, and and hearing the beats that he was bringing in, mm. seeing how we could make them better, how we could bring them in line with the rest of the record, adding the live elements to them um, seeing any gaps that needed to be filled in terms of sonics or other tracks that we needed to write or but I mean Storms is a, an incredible visionary so it's really working with him to mm. help him achieve what's going on in his head mm. Yeah, and I don't think you can credit him enough with with what he brings to the table. And that's why I think he's a special artist as well, because even what you said before, you know, Dreamer's Disease wasn't a... It's not a grime... It's not a grime EP. Mm. And I always thought that when he was coming into making this project, like, what does he do now? Because he's had these, like, big grime records, does he now make an album for what he thinks that people want to hear from him? Mm. Or does he do what he just wants to do in his heart? Do you mm. get me? Mm. And that's why I think that yeah, it was a, it was a one of the, probably one of the best decisions that he could have made coming and working with somebody like you and collaborating mm. and being able to come and sit down and just you know have these ideas in his head and you be able to musically help him put it together. Do you know what I mean? And you essentially did what. Rick Rubin did yeah. for Adele, isn't it? There you, you go. You, you Rick Rubin Stormzy. I'm going to say yeah. <laughs> And, I, and, and yeah, I'll say yeah. this. What he was trying to do on Dreamer's Disease, like he has executed and nailed on Gang Signs and Prayers. Prayer, like he, re he really has. And look, you know, the album is out now. It's crazy. Um, if you don't have it, buy it and then stream, stream it. That. If you do have it, buy another copy. Yeah, yeah buy yeah, another copy. Buy the physical copy. Because... I actually think it's one of them albums, yeah, that you <coughs> you should have a physical copy of. I'm not even just trying to plug it like that. I just think that it's you true. have what you get occasionally. You get those albums that mean something yeah. for a period of time yeah. or at a yeah. period of time. Yeah, and to symbolize that and to be a part of that, I think it's one of those things where you go out and you don't just you don't just stream it you don't just you know download it on itunes you actually buy a copy of that and you hold that and you're like you know what i remember you can look back mm. on that and say yeah like i remember that moment that when stormzy did a madness and as because as we speak you know the album's in the chart we've yep. got two days left until friday it's incredibly close between you know him and, and rag we and say Bone two Man. days left to friday but we friday. don't know when this is coming out bro this is coming oh yeah, up. this is coming out on Wednesday. It's coming out tomorrow. It's really my flow. <laughs> <laughs> so well, look, I mean, this is a podcast, right? like for him, for him to have a number one, like honestly, yeah, no, not I mean. not from my point of view, <coughs> but from Storms' point of view, and and the point of view, I think like the scene. Obviously, I'm like massively invested, but but for him to have that number one, yeah, 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 is huge. I think it just means means so much because I think no one else from the scene has, has had that number one so mm, I feel that yeah. it, it's a could be a moment in time yeah for him and and for the grime scene yeah so and, and now, for the vote, scene vote Stormzy yeah man and if you bought Rag and Bone Man as I love Rag and Bone <laughs> Man but just 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 get a refund buy it on later that. yeah yeah buy, buy that later, later. buy, that, the next buy week. that next week you know Sorry to mess up your flow because you was right, but and and yeah, but no, it's important. Honestly, if you're listening now, please buy the record. All right, yeah. um, I want to say thank. I can't thank you enough for doing this. Actually, I can't I thank think, you enough um, for coming to the it's studio. It's been a very productive conversation, and as I say all of the time, you know, I learn a lot from doing stuff like this and for having these type of conversations. And there's a lot of people out there that want to know and want to hear this. And if there's one little thing that can be said that could inspire them to go on and do great things, then you know what? Like I, I would feel fulfilled in that. And I know that there's a lot of things that you've said today that would 
definitely help a lot of people and 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 you know that what people would find very interesting is there um anything else like on special that you're working on at the moment that you want to throw in i'm working with the incredibly talented dave oh yes come on the santan oh, yes miss santan. santan you know santan Santan. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the you connected again, you two. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, Dave is. I mean, I'm, like I said, I come in here every day. It's like being a kid in the sweet shop. But if you haven't got the artists to to work with, mm. I mean, you know, I'm 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 not the guy that can can send out beats. I don't gas myself up making making music on my own for me it's about mm. collaborating so therefore if I don't have the right artists I'm dead mm. you know so to have worked with all the 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 incredible if you just take out the singers take out the bands but just look at the MCs and you look at you know Kane and Getz and Jay Haas and now Stormzy and and now working with Dave is is just is taking things on, you know. His yeah. musicality is is where me and him really bond. So he'll mm. play on the piano. The first track that we ever wrote was "Picture Me," which mm. was the first real meeting, wasn't it? We yeah, tried to yeah. meet the first time. He overslept. Yeah, yeah. We didn't really get to meet. He came in the second time. Mm -hmm. I was playing guitar. He was jamming on the piano, and and uh, yeah, I, I think what's exciting for me is that. Dave brings something to the table that isn't Stormzy and isn't Getz and it isn't Jay Huss and it isn't Kane and I think that it's Dave that it, it's Dave and mm. I think that Dave couldn't exist without Stormzy or without Kane or mm. without all the amazing MCs out there but the incredible thing is that he's drawing also from Pink Floyd and from mm. Sega film Sega Mega Drive, Mega yeah. Drive mm. music and from Epic Schindler's List yeah, yeah. Mm. film soundtracks so he's a special kid man he's a very Dave's special a, Dave's a very, very special, special kid. kid so I think that's what's what's truly exciting me at the minute yeah yeah man well <laughs> is there anything you want to add yeah, to that well, I mean it's a you know it's a it's a blessing to be able to like yeah, see him and Fraser, you yeah. know, enjoying creating music again. And it's like, you know, Dave is like, I don't know how to describe him, but what, like, musically, what he wants to, like, put down on a record and what he wants to kind of uh, just express, like, it's, you've got to keep up with him in the mm. studio, I think. And I think... It, he would probably overwhelm a lot of people, so it's it's a blessing to be able to come in with someone like like Fraser into a place like this, and you know work with Manon as well, and just really like see him happy that he's able to realise his vision. Like honestly, because yeah, he's he that kid has got an insane amount of content within him, and an, and a, 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 a mad amount of ideas in his head, and I think like not not meeting someone like Fraser would be it would be it would be terrible for him I think he would be very frustrated not to be able to get those ideas out and collaborate and and, and whatever you know um, so it's great it's, it's really it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing to to watch and see and I know that yeah it's good when you can see both parties really enjoying it so it's great I'm excited to see what what comes off it obviously they've done the six path CP together mm -hmm. and now it's you know, it's onwards and upwards, and I guess you know more records and eventually album time. So yeah, and congratulations on one and know as well because mm. obviously that's Crazy. just gone through the roof Crazy. of Dave as well. Let's not forget <coughs> one six nine. Well, he's well, that guy that comes yeah. into the studio, and I'm like, how did you just make something so amazing in yeah. like three and a half minutes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. just no. It's, I was chatting guy. to Tyrell earlier today, and I, I was, he just sent me like this folder of beats, and I was like what the f Talented, yeah, send yeah. me more beats like please <laughs> yeah. like, I don't really like sit and just listen to beats much anymore but he just sent me this folder of beats now like these beats sick. are insane yeah okay. yeah it's amazing yeah, man. well thanks for the conversation thank you yeah thank you for and I'm sure like once some more stuff more Grammys more awards Dave goes through the roof all of these other <coughs> we'll do another we'll do a part two 
Let's do it. Oh, Ireland for you. Oh yeah, maybe why not? <laughs> there you go. Yeah, after I do like Jay Z, Beyonce, you, you can sit and chat to me about. He's going to do a Berkeley course right after this. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but no, Fraser, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you for sitting down with us. And um, thanks for yeah. inviting me on. No, all yeah, good. Man. We'll be back two weeks time. The neighborhood show. Yeah, man. Peace. Nice.